Turn with me to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8. That's going to be our text this evening. Um, we're going to do verses 1 through 12, but before that I'll give a little bit of a background and context of where I'm just placing y'all right in the middle of the book of Nehemiah. Um, so the text that we have here, we have um, Ezra and Nehemiah were considered one book, one unit, for the longest time. Um, in the Hebrew Bible, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, all had Nehemiah and Ezra together. And it wasn't until the third century that those books were divided into two separate books. Um, you see that also in the Latin Vulgate, the Latin translation of the Hebrew Bible with Jerome taking that. And then Ezra and Nehemiah were placed before First and Second Chronicles because it was believed that Ezra, scholars think that Ezra wrote Ezra, Nehemiah, First and Second Chronicles. So they were placed together, but still Ezra and Nehemiah being one unit and one book. And then in the outline of Ezra leading up to Nehemiah, in chronological order, you have the rebuilding and sustaining of, of Israel, Jerusalem, coming back and being rebuilt. In chapter 1, you have Cyrus, the king of Persia. His orders were to be fulfilled of what Jeremiah the prophet spoke. And so Ezra in chapter 1 through 6 of Ezra goes back and returns to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of God. And then Ezra chapter 7 to 10, you have the second return of Ezra to rebuild the people of God. That would be a good outline of the book of Ezra. And then you have the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1 to chapter 7, you have the return of Nehemiah to rebuild the walls surrounding the city of God. And then chapter 7 through 13 of Nehemiah, a return of another group of exiles and the rebuilding of God's people. Very similar structure, very similar outline, very similar characters, Ezra and Nehemiah. And so where I'm placing us tonight in chapter 8, um, to kind of give you more context, if you look at Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 73, we find ourselves in the seventh month. This is the, the celebration of the Day of the Atonement, the festival of the tabernacles. The first day of the seventh month was a Sabbath day, the Feast of Trumpets. Leviticus 23, 24, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first of the month, you shall have a rest, a memorial by blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. And then in Leviticus 23, verse 27, on exactly the tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you, and you shall humble your souls and bring an offering by fire near to Yahweh. And then finally, Leviticus 23, 34, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, on the fifteenth of the seventh month is the feast of booze or tabernacles, the seventh days to Yahweh. So that's where we're at. We're right at the beginning of a great celebration in Jerusalem. And I'll be reading from the Legacy Standard Bible, not for any being particular reason or John MacArthur snob or anything like that. I just do my devotions in this. And this was in part of my devotions, was read through Nehemiah, and I came across this text and thought I would teach it. So Israel's come back from captivity in Babylon. They've returned to Jerusalem. They've rebuilt the temple of God. They rebuilt the walls, thanks to Ezra and Nehemiah's leadership. And they find themselves in the seventh month. Nehemiah is governor. Ezra is priest. And on this day, the first day of the seventh month, the people of God assemble. And that's where we're going to start in chapter 8, verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man at the square. All the people of Jerusalem gather together as if they are one man. They assemble together as if one person together came. God's people are held together with a special, unbreakable bond that unites them. And what unites them is the mercies of God. It is God's mercies that God's people, we, the church, and Israel, were united together that could come and assemble together as one body, as one man. The mercies of God manifest themselves in many ways, and I just want to highlight three that's in Nehemiah um, chapter 8 and in Ezra, it's all over the place, but it's still true now. And the first thing is that God's love unites us together. We can come together and assemble as one man because of the love of God. When God sovereignly elects a people, they are no longer of the world, they are no longer of the kingdom of darkness, but they are brought into a kingdom of his marvelous light. They're 
brought together as children. God loves them as children. He loves his people as children. The love of God is such a powerful thing that it makes all things new, even by bringing sinful people together and uniting them as one man. His forgiving love, his faithful, unchanging love, unites many people together to become as one man, assembling in a square. The second thing that unites them is the Spirit of God. God's Spirit, His Holy Spirit, the great guarantor and uh, seal of our faith that dwells in His people and dwells in the temple now in Nehemiah chapter 8 is what brings us all together in assembly, unites us together as the Spirit of God. He regenerates us. He keeps us. He sustains us. He directs us. He grows us. He educates us. That's what unites us. We are collectively and individually the temple of God. We see that in Nehemiah 8. God's temple is restored. And then we see in the New Testament, um, in the church, we are the temple of God. God dwells in us as his people. The third thing, and this is the thing I want to emphasize tonight, that unites us together, that can cause us and bring us as one man in an assembly, is the word of God. The word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword, Hebrews says. It places an ocean between those who trust in and those who do not trust in the word of God. It separates, it cuts, it divides. It's power. It's the power of God and salvation. It convicts the soul. It's truth. The word is truth. The truth sets us free from ignorance and impending doom, and that comes by means of the word of God. Jesus Christ is the word of God. He unites us. We are united in him. And so that's what we have here in Nehemiah chapter 8. Um, we, are not, we are united, they are united by God's love, his spirit, and his word. These are three big mercies that come and that can bring unity to God's people who have been abandoned, left in captivity, struggling. His chosen people have rebuilt the temple, they've gathered together, and they are in desperate need of one more thing. They have the love of God, they have the Spirit of God, but in Nehemiah chapter 8 we're going to read that they need the Word of God. That's what's going to unite them together. In Nehemiah 1, uh, chapter 8, verse 1 through 3, And all the people gathered as one man at the square, which was in front of the water gate. And they said to Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which Yahweh had commanded to Israel. Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could understand when listening on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of men and women, those who could understand, and all the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. Some quick observations, and I'm not going to preach for six hours, so we're good there. Uh, men, women, and children, all who could hear, gathered together and gave attentive ears to the preaching of of God's word, the expounding, the reading of God's word. They unite as one man, they assemble before God as one heart, one common desire, and that is to hear Yahweh speak to them. And that didn't come out of the sky, that didn't come in their prayer closets, that didn't come in their drives to communion with the saints, it came by preaching of the word, by reading of the word, is how Yahweh would speak to his people. Notice in verse two, all who could understand, everyone who could hear and understand was listening. We are reminded of Jesus' words 16 times um, from Matthew to Revelation. We read in the New Testament, he who has ears, let him hear. It's all over the New Testament. From Jesus and his ministry to him speaking to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, he who has ears, let him hear. Mark chapter 10, verses 14 through 16. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms and began blessing them and laying hands on them. All who could hear on this first day of the seventh month included children. All who could hear. We as a church are commissioned to not hinder children from hearing the words of Yahweh. We let them come, we let them hear the word of God, and we assemble with them. Remember, they came as one man, men, women, and children. As fathers, we shouldn't hinder our children from the words of God. 
We shouldn't hinder our wives, our children, our families, our households. We should know the scriptures and lead them in the scriptures. We read ahead in Nehemiah, I'm not going to go here, but in verse 13 of chapter 8, we read that the heads of households come for this very purpose. After what we're going to study tonight, it says, then on the second day, this is after this day of six hours of preaching and teaching, then on the second day, the heads of fathers of households of all the people, the priests and the Levites, were gathered to Ezra, the scribe, that they might gain insight into the words of the law. They have another gathering with the men of the households and the Levites and Ezra, and they have a Bible study. They gain more insight, teach us more. How can we apply? How can we obey? How can we lead our families in the words of Yahweh? It is the men, as the heads of the households, it is their duty to instruct and lead their families in the word of God. Not Pastor Mike, not me, not anyone. It is the men, it is the leaders of the household to instruct their children, to lead their wives in scripture. It is men's job to go and gain insight that they may lead their families. Be diligent students of the scriptures. It is not anyone's job to teach children than the parents. And that's very weighty on my heart because we have three kids that we're trying to do that with. Instruct them and teach them. Just read to them what God says. And we're responsible. Men are responsible. We will one day have to give an account for how we led or did not lead our families in God's words. The men of Israel had conviction. They didn't have conviction over a football team. They didn't have conviction over their favorite preferred band or truck or whatever. They had conviction over how are we going to lead our family? We've heard the word been preached today or yesterday. This was the second day. And now we need to know how to live by it. How do we apply it? How do we lead our families? They had great conviction in this. They had conviction in following the words of God and knowing the words of God. Um, and we had a men's conference one time, and one of the things says, men will never become men of God if they don't know God's words. They'll forever be boys. And they will never be men of God if they don't know God's words. Um, Joshua 24, 15, a text that gets used a lot. In fact, I was driving today, and I saw someone had the decal on the back of their truck. Um, Joshua 24, 15, if it is evil in your sight to serve Yahweh, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river of the gods of the Amorites in the, whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh. A representative of the family speaks on the family's behalf. Ephesians 6.4 is the New Testament equivalent. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Or as Nehemiah um, looked at it as he's rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem in chapter 4, we should take a mindset of Nehemiah and fight for our families. Though not physically uh, conquer, um, but they weren't. They were defending here. Um, I'm good on time. Now it happened, verse 7 through 14, chapter 4, when Sambalot, Tobiah, and Arabas, the Ammonites, and the Ashadotites heard that the repair of the walls of Jerusalem went on, and that the places were broken, began, broken down began to be closed, they were very angry, and all of them joined together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause a disturbance in it. But we prayed to our God, and because of them we stood a guard against them day and night. Then Judah said, The strength of the burden bearers is falling, yet there is much rubbish, and we ourselves are unable to rebuild the wall. Our adversary said, verse 11, They will not know or see until we come among them. Kill them and put a stop to their work. Now it happened when the Jews who lived near them came and said to us ten times, they will come up against us from every place where they may turn. And I had the men stand in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall and exposed places, and I had the people stand by families with their swords, spears, and bows. Then I saw their fear, and I rose and said to the nobles, the officials, the rest of the people, do not fear them. Remember the Lord who is great and fearsome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. We don't have anyone coming to tear down our walls. We don't live in Jerusalem. But men, we should fight for our families by preaching and teaching and explaining the scriptures to them. 
because the enemy is coming after them. The world, Satan. We should protect them and fight for them by educating them with the scriptures. And we shouldn't wait for anyone to, to lead us to them. Although we're blessed here, I think. Um, but men should be willing to seek understanding, women, children, anybody, that they may understand God and his word. And what's exciting about that is that we'll never accomplish that. No one has ever accomplished that. We will never fully or comprehend and understand God. We can never map him out. There is no perimeter that we'll reach in his majesty. There is no explorer that has left behind a trail for us to follow in the paths of understanding all that there is to know about God. He is far beyond our comprehension. Therefore, he is worthy to look into. He is worthy to know. He is worthy to observe and to meditate over, to be obsessed over, like the men in Jerusalem. Teach us, teach us more. We have to know more. And notice the book that Ezra reads from and the request. Read to us the book of Moses. That would be the Pentateuch, or the Torah, the five books that Moses wrote. Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's the books that they read from. They didn't read from Ephesians, chapter 1 or chapter 2. They read from the book of Moses. And they read, or they listened to, as we read from it, for six hours. Attentively listening to him. It says, from early morning to midday. And it's sad because we can't make it 50 minutes on Sunday mornings. They listened to it for six hours. Children, six hours, listening to the book of Moses be read. Here we have men, women, children listening to the words of God half the day, attentively listening to it, not yawning, not dozing off, not checking the score of the football game, not coming in late, not leaving early. They're one man. They came as one man. One assembly. Some scholars suggest that it would take, uh, it's impossible that it would take six hours to read all five books of Moses that he may have got to Exodus or Leviticus or something like that. He couldn't have read the, the whole book. Some people say that, as we're going to read, that there was men standing on each side of him that they rotated with him and helped him read because his voice couldn't handle reading for six hours. Um, but Ezra knew his scriptures we read in Ezra chapter 7, verse 6, and in verse 10, that um, this Ezra went up to Babylon, and he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses, which Yahweh, the God of Israel, had given. And the king granted him all that he requested, because the hand of Yahweh, his God, was upon him. And then in verse 10, for Ezra not only knew the scriptures, not only skilled in the scriptures, verse 10, for Ezra had set his heart to study the law of Yahweh and to practice it, and to teach its statute and judgment in Israel. We would be wise to surround ourselves and gather amongst people like Ezra who know God's word. If you have free time, surround yourselves and have discussions about God's word with people who know God's word. He instructs people, he practices it, and he's a great theologian. This is something that wives should look for in their husbands. This is something that young men should look up to to become men of God. Someone who knows the scriptures and lives by the scriptures. Ezra didn't just know it, he practiced it. And so then we go to verse 4, chapter 8. Ezra the scribe stood, and I listened to the audio all day today, and I still can't pronounce these names right. <laughs> so we'll try. Ezra the scribe took on a wooden podium which they had made for the, for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, Messiah, and on his right, and, uh, and on his right hand, Empadiah, Mashal, Makajah, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshalam on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed Yahweh, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. Then they bowed low and worshipped Yahweh with their faces to the ground. 
There was a wooden platform built. Ezra was the first pulpit preacher. No. This was not a, a podium. It was more of like a big deck because it had 13 men on it. We had um, it, well, 14 including him. We had six men on his right, seven on his left. Ezra then takes the book and opens it in sight of all the people. He reads from it. Hands lifted up, bodies bowed down low to the ground, lips crying out, Amen, Amen. Ezra is leading them in worship. He is the worship leader in Jerusalem. And all he did was hold up a book, open it, and read from it. Ministers of the Word of God must take their Bibles with them. If in your travels or vacations and you go and gather on a Lord's Day at another church other than South Strand, if they don't have a Bible and read from it, it's not much of an assembly. Our pastor does that very well. And like a conductor over a choir, the preacher moves the heartstrings of each people with each word that he expounds and reads from in God's scriptures. And that's what Ezra does. He causes the people to go into worship as he's reading. They're worshiping God. This is how the people of God are edified. This is how the church is built up. It's not by clever worship music or fog machines or lighting or food. It is by God's word that the church is built up. Your doxology will only go as high as your theology of God. Your understanding of God is what fuels your worship to God. In light of his mercies and his holiness and his goodness and his work and his creation and his mighty hand, it fuels your worship. Uh, Paul charged Timothy not to forsake this very thing in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Until I come, give attention. Give attention to the public reading of Scripture to exhortation and teaching. The public reading of Scripture. And then exhort and teach. And then note what follows after Ezra does this. After he holds up the book and reads from it and the people go into worship, we read in verse 7 through 9. Um, here's some more names I'm going to mess up. Also, Jeshua, Baini, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shepathiah, Hobadiah, Messiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites were providing understanding of the law to the people while the people stood in their place. They read from the book, from the law of God, explaining and giving insight, and they provided understanding of the reading. Then Nehemiah, verse 9, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who provided the people with understanding, said to all the people, This day is holy to Yahweh your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. What changed? What happened? We go from hands raised, tongues confessing, Bowing down in worship to people are broken. They need to be consoled and comforted. They're sad. They're weeping. They're not just weeping. The text says they're mourning. What happened? It's because Ezra, Nehemiah, and the Levites provided understanding. Verse 8 tells us that they read from the book again, but this time with explaining and giving insight in order to provide more understanding of the reading. Um, this is the way the Legacy Standard Bible translates. Um, they render the word expl explaining, which is parash in the Hebrew. Some English translations will put translate. They'll just say they translated the book. Um, because the word means to cut or to separate or to divide. To cut up the word, to unpack it, to translate it, to break it down so they may understand it. Some scholars suggest that they couldn't speak Hebrew due to their captivity, that they spoke um, Aramaic, and this was them translating it into Aramaic. That, that could be. Uh, I'd like to think that they were expository preachers. They were expounding the text. They were expounding the Word of God. They're giving an explanation of what it means. And when that happens, you're broken. You're ruined. Weeping and mourning is the only response when the Word of God is not only read and professed to you, but then explained to you. You find yourself in God's light and your sinful deeds are exposed and you're ruined. 
and comfort is needed. Nehemiah and Ezra, along with the Levites, comfort the people. They're weeping. They remember all their idolatrous acts and their sins. They're mourning for their souls as if they're already condemned. And this is the appropriate response. God is the justifier of the ungodly. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. But to the one who does not work, but believes upon him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. In Charles Spurgeon's work, All of Grace, he says this is one of the greatest texts in the Bible. God, the justifier of the ungodly. Those are the only people he justifies as ungodly people. It is ungodly people whom Christ justifies, because Christ came to save sinners. Mark chapter 2, verse 16 through 17. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they were saying to his disciples, he is eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners. And hearing this, Jesus said to them, those who are healthy do not need a physician, but only those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. God only deals with sinners. Those are the only people he interacts with. Those are the only people he deals with. He either shows mercy or he shows wrath to sinners. There's no righteous party that he ever has to deal with. It is only sinners that God deals with. And all of God's creation, aside from the angels that remain and uh, surround his throne and praise him, but on earth, men, they're only sinners. There's no righteous man that he has to ever deal with. For what glory would God receive for justifying a righteous man? None. How could God show his wrath towards a righteous person? He cannot. Because it's only those who are sinners, ungodly, that he deals with. Mercy and wrath. And they know this, and they stand condemned in their sin, and they weep bitterly because they know they're worthy of God's judgment. They're worthy of punishment. They fear God. But there's good news for those who weep in fear of God. Good news is only for them. Only those who weep and fear God. And that leads us to verse 10 and verse 12. Then he said to them, Go, eat the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. Remember, this is the Feast of Trumpets. For this day is holy to our Lord. This is also a Sabbath. Do not be grieved, for the joy of Yahweh is your strength. So the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. Then all the people went away to eat, to drink, to send portions, and to celebrate with great gladness, because they understood the words which had been made known to them. I think that's the uh, hope and prayer of every pastor on Sunday morning, that everyone would leave here celebrating with great gladness because the words of God were made known to them. Eating the fat means get the best meat, the best meat, the best cut. Drinking the sweet means break out the best wine, mix it with honey. Send portions to people who don't have anything prepared means share this with those who don't have these great things. Celebrate. For this is a day holy to our Lord. And then there's this phrase, the joy of Yahweh. What is that? What is the joy of Yahweh? What does that mean? It means both the joy of Yahweh is his joy. It delights him and he shares it with us. And therefore it's our strength. It strengthens us up when we are weeping and broken and left dead in our sins. His joy comes and strengthens us. He delights to strengthen his people. He delights to save sinners. He rejoices over us when he saves us. Not because we're anything good or righteous or have good deeds, but because he is good. It delights him to strengthen his people. It delights him to give us the kingdom. Luke says, uh, well, uh, Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, Do not fear, little flock, for your father is well pleased to give you the kingdom. It pleases him. It delights him. It is his joy and that's what strengthens God's people. It doesn't matter what translation you have. I have the LSB. It doesn't matter. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of Yahweh is your strength. The promise is the same, no matter which translation you have. 
And then finally note, without preaching, without revealing, without explaining, without expounding God's words, this would not have happened. This wouldn't have happened unless they explained, unless they gave understanding. They wouldn't be weeping. They wouldn't be drove to mourning if explanation had not been given. But it was given. It is God's joy to make himself known and to save and forgive sinners. And we have reminded of Revelation chapter 21, when all things will be made new, there won't be any weeping. There won't be any mourning. Verse 1 through 7, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. And there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death, and there will no longer be any mourning, or crying, or pain. The first things passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, They are done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things. And I will be his God and he will be my son. The joy of Yahweh is our strength, and that comes when there is understanding of God's word, the spirit, and God's love is on us. And there will no longer be weeping or mourning when our sins are exposed and when we're dealing with them and suffering in this world because sin has infected everything. But he'll wipe away every tear and there will, no, there will be no more mourning. Um, the joy of Yahweh is our strength. Praise God for his word. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for allowing us to assemble as one man this, this night and to praise you and to pray to you, commune with you, for the veil has been torn. We can have access to you now. We can commune with you, our Father. And Lord, now we've looked at your word, and I pray that it would affect our hearts, it would stir up our affections towards you and your scriptures, that we would meditate, memorize, dwell on, seek explanation and understanding of these words, that we would be filled, changed, molded into the image of your son, become more like him, that we'll be like Ezra, know them and practice them. Lord, we ask that we would be given boldness, that we would go share this word, this gospel, with those who don't believe, that your joy will strengthen them, that they will weep and mourn when their sins are exposed, and the Holy Spirit convicts their heart with the gospel message, and we'll be there to comfort them as we explain the, the glorious graces and mercies that Christ offers for those who trust in him. Lord, do that for us tonight. Sanctify us, grow us, and keep us safe as we leave here. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.